Financial Survival Network, helping you survive and thrive in the new economy. Go to CarryLutz.com and sign up for 30 free micro trainings on financial survival. Fourteen ninety WGCH. This is Kerry Lutz. You're listening to the Financial Survival Network. If you're worried about the dollar, if you're worried about your wealth and your country, then you need to hear from the, my next guest, Jim Rickards. He's written a book, Currency Wars. He's been an insider, a finance expert for many, many years, and he's with us now. Jim, welcome to the Financial Survival Network. Thanks, Kerry. Nice to be with you. It's really good to have you on because I have so many questions for you. I've listened to so many of your interviews over the past couple of years. You've written a new book, Currency Wars, on the New York Times uh, bestseller list. Just briefly sum up uh, where you think it's all heading. Well, uh, thank you, Kerry. Yeah, the book, uh, we've had a lot of uh, success with it. It was a New York Times and a national bestseller. Um, and uh, the book uh, takes uh, the reader through the history of the international monetary system from approximately 1870 to 2011. So it brings the story right down to uh, today. But uh, just to kind of cut to the chase, I mean, it would talk you know, about the currency wars, the destruction of currencies in the 1920s, uh, devaluation of currency, things going on in the uh, in the 1970s and the 1980s along the same lines. But um, the there is a sort of a golden thread that runs through all of it. I start with the uh, classic international gold standard of the 18 uh, beginning around 1870. Talk about flaws uh, in the uh, what's called the gold exchange standard of the 1920s. Uh, talk about both FDR in 1933, and Richard Nixon again in 1971, going off the gold standard uh, in different ways. And then kind of bringing that story all the way forward, and just to cut to the chase, um, I see the international monetary system evolving in one of four directions. And that sounds like I'm just kind of throwing up my hands and saying, oh, gee, it could be anything. And that's, that's not the case. Uh, the four models I've laid out are very specific, but more importantly, I give the reader specific what we call indications and warnings or signposts along the way so it's hard to know today exactly where we'll end up but uh, i do have ways of figuring out which path we're on so you'll, you'll be able to know in advance which road we're going down the first path um, is a world of multiple reserve currencies the dollar in 2000 represented about 70 percent of global reserves that's all the savings of all the our trading partners and uh, investment partners around the world uh, by today, uh, by 2012, that percentage had dropped to 60%. So we've seen the dollar come down from 70% to 60%. Imagine that trend continuing, so the dollar ends up at 40%, maybe the euro comes up in its share, close to 40%, and we see the Swiss franc and the yuan uh, come up, or the yuan be introduced for the first putting all that together. You can have a world of multiple reserve currencies. This is something that's favored uh, by a lot of economists. A lot of economists even say that this is definitely the way the world's heading. Um, they may be right, but I see it as being problematic uh, because there's no anchor. There is no gold standard. You know, we're, we haven't been on the gold standard since 1971, but we have been on the dollar standard. Uh, at least there's something that somebody else can peg to. But if you create these multiple reserve currencies, uh, I don't see any peg, any anchor. Um, so instead of one central bank uh, using its privileges, specifically the Fed, you could have five or six central banks behaving badly. So I don't think it's a stable system at all. The second path, I think the one favored by the elites, when I say elites, I mean um, central bankers, finance ministers, uh, some economists, policymakers, etc., is the, uh, the SDR, that's the special drawing right. Uh, that's a global currency issued by the IMF. A lot of people understand that uh, the U.S. has a central bank, the Fed, and it can print dollars. The ECB can print euros, but they don't know that the IMF can print these SDRs to literally create them out of thin air, not backed by anything, pass them out to the members as a way to create global liquidity. Um, same way the Fed does with dollars, except that there's even less accountability uh, at the IMF level. So um, just sort of flooding the world with SDR is something that was uh, um, done in 1969 for the first time, but done most recently in 2009, uh, is another possibility. The third possibility is the return to the gold standard. Um, this is something that I think should be studied. 
Uh, a lot of people like to bang the table and say, you know, we need a gold standard for, for stable money or sound money. But if you ask them what the gold standard is, they actually don't know or they can't specify it. The truth is there's no one set gold standard. There are a number of ways of doing it depending on um, some choices you make. And in the book, I point out what those variables are. Uh, the first one you have to think about is, is the money supply. I mean, every gold standard is some ratio of money to gold, paper money to gold. Well, what's your definition of paper money? If you use M0 or M1, uh, that's a particular result. But if you use M2, uh, that's a much larger amount, so you would get a different implied paper to gold ratio. Second question you have to ask yourself is how much gold backing do you want for the paper money? Uh, a lot of people say it's 100% or nothing because we can't really trust the government. Uh, but in fact, historically, England had a very successful gold standard in the 19th century with 20% backing. And the United States, historically, when we were on the gold standard, had 40% backing. So history shows that you know, if you have a central bank and a substantial amount of gold uh, or a willingness to back up your paper money, by exchanging for gold at a fixed rate, you can run a gold standard with less than 100%. That's the third thing you have to decide. And the fourth thing is who's in the club. Um, uh, you could have uh, just the United States, which I think is unlikely because um, uh, if the U.S. had a gold-backed currency, we'd have the only currency that anybody in the world wanted. Nobody would want the other currencies. Uh, and that would reduce money supply because no one would really treat the others as money, and that would be highly deflationary, which is undesirable. So when you include Europe and China, again, you get different results because China, for example, has a, uh, an M1 uh, slightly larger than the United States, uh, but they only have one-eighth the amount of gold. So if you include China with the U.S., it's highly diluted. You're bringing in, you know, you're doubling the paper money, but you're only increasing the gold by, uh, by about 12 percent. So uh, that means a higher, again, implied price of gold. So taking all these things together, um, uh, you know, who's in or who's out, how much gold backing do you have, and what's your definition of money supply, you get a range of prices. At the low end of the range, $3,000 an ounce. At the high end of the range, upwards of $44,000 an ounce. So my, my own uh, expectation is that gold will settle in somewhere around $7,000 an ounce. And that'll take some years, but um, I would look for it to move in that direction. But that's another way to get the sound money. The fourth way, and I think the one that's most likely, is actually chaos. Uh, you know, just a complete collapse of confidence in the paper money system on a global basis. This is not anything anybody wants. It's not anything anyone's planning for. But it's what can happen in a dynamically unstable system through denial, delay, wishful thinking, kicking the can down the road, et cetera. So uh, for all those reasons, I would look out for that. And of course, the way to protect yourself is with uh, things like land, uh, fine art, uh, gold, silver, other hard assets. So, so I've got, I call them the four horsemen of the dollar apocalypse, that multiple reserve currencies, SDRs, gold, and chaos. Uh, and uh, I, I kind of hope for gold because it's sound money, but I'm sort of expecting chaos. Right. So you uh, hope for the best, plan for the worst. And, you know, you bring up some good points that uh, the fact that uh, you, know, you really people really don't feel that they can trust any governmental authority to actually fix a money supply. And even though when we had the gold standard in the U.S., it was only 40 percent backing at at one time or another, that was enough to stop the profligate printing and uh, huge inflation that we're seeing today. But the question that a lot of people have is, does the U.S. really have that 8,100 tons of gold? Is it encumbered or pledged by others? And I'm just wondering from your background and your uh, involvement in the monetary system, do you think it really is there? And uh, unencumbered, a, a real asset of the U.S.? Well, those are two different questions, Kerry. One, is it physically there? And number two, is it encumbered in any way? Uh, uh, I've studied it very closely. Let's put it this way. I've seen no evidence to the contrary. I'm, I'm very uh, evidence-based. I don't believe in conspiracy theories. I don't believe in outright speculation. Sometimes when you don't have all the facts uh, and you're trying to put a mosaic together, yes, sometimes you have to make inferences. Or, but there are some very rigorous, uh, kind of intellectually... Uh, uh, academically acceptable uh, Bayesian techniques and other causal inference techniques for doing that in a rigorous way, and I try to stick to that, so I don't really uh, subscribe to some of the more um, uh, far-fetched theories, not because they couldn't possibly be true, but just because there's no evidence to support them. So the short answer is uh, I have every reason to believe that the goal is there. Of course, it's not all in Fort Knox. Uh, 
Uh, we have about 8,000 tons, but only about half of that is in Fort Knox. The other half is in a sediment depository in, in West Point. Uh, then there's a small amount of the Denver Mint and a very small amount of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So that's where the U.S. gold is. Um, whether it's encumbered or not uh, is a different issue. The encumbrance uh, could take the form of uh, a lease, uh, but that's not really an encumbrance. In other words, if the U.S. is leasing the gold to third parties, making it available to them uh, for use in commercial transactions, remember the gold doesn't have to actually go anywhere. It can sit in a Fort Knox or it can sit in West Point. I can sign a gold lease with you that says I hereby lease you this, this amount of gold. You agree to pay me some interest rates to have a little bit of income on it. The gold doesn't have to go anywhere, but you've now got good hypothecatable title. You can then go into the commercial marketplace and then sell the gold. Uh, but again, it doesn't go anywhere. You sell paper gold. A lot of people who think they own gold don't actually own it if they, you know, at least in the physical sense or even in the segregated sense. If they read their contracts carefully, they would find that they're counterparties to J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs or HSBC on a um, gold contract that specifically is unallocated, which means that if they came to get their gold um, in certain circumstances, the bank would have the option to physically deliver it, which they, would, they could arrange because gold is fungible. It's an element, it's atomic number 79, or they could just pay you out in cash. So I think there are going to be a lot of disappointed gold investors at the end of the day who find out that they don't actually have a claim on physical gold. But bear in mind, the U.S. could be providing the gold by listening to third parties without physically removing it from West Point or Fort Knox. These would be paper transactions. But who's really vulnerable in that world? I and mean, if the U.S. decides that they want their gold back and they call J.P. Morgan and say, you know, uh, we want to cancel this contract, and J.P. Morgan says, wait a second, I can't because I've sold the gold to a third party. The answer is, well, too bad. You have to sort of buy it in close out that transaction, close out your transaction with us. And if you can't do that, we'll just close it out for you. And so that would leave J.P. Morgan short in my example. So it's not the U.S. that's vulnerable to gold leasing. It's the party that borrowed the gold, that sold it to the market, that is net short gold. If the U.S. calls it in, they, they can't cover it. And they're the ones who are damaged commercially. So I don't see the U.S. being vulnerable at all. And I think that people don't really understand. They like these fantasy theories, but they don't really understand how the commercial gold market works. Yeah, possession really is nine-tenths of the law. The only reason I bring it up, when you're talking about analyzing a situation and the simplest explanation is usually the correct one, the thing is, why won't the Fed uh, or the Treasury have an audit of the actual gold holdings and disclose it? What do they have to fear from that? That's the only reason that makes me wonder what they're up to and uh, who actually has title to the gold. But in the final analysis, I agree with you, it really doesn't matter because if it's sitting in the vault here, just like there's 7,000 tons, and I've seen it myself in the basement of the Federal Reserve, at least it looked like gold to me. If there's 7,000 tons there, it's there. And when push comes to shove, if it's needed, it'll be used, I guess. When you talk about uh, devolving into chaos, because we don't have anyone in power now who really wants to take control and ownership of this current crisis. You know, they're really all a try, trying to, like you said, kick the can down the road, hand it off to the next guy. Who's the person that's out there that you see in the political process who's willing to say, all right, the system is unstable inherently. It's becoming more unstable by the day. We have to have a solution and get all of the parties to sit down and come up with a new system. Does that person exist out there, Jim? Um, I don't see anyone who said it in, in so many words. Of course, Ron Paul has been someone who said we ought to end the Fed. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know that from 1835 to 1913, there was no central bank in the United States. And that was a period that had ups and downs and financial panics as all uh, periods do. But um, that was a period on the whole of very good prosperity, uh, um, you know, low inflation or even mild deflation. Uh, technological innovation and growth in the United States of America. So America can prosper without a central bank. That's been demonstrated by history. Whether you actually have to abolish the Fed, or uh, my preference would be maybe you keep the Fed around, but you rein them in a little bit with some kind of you know modified gold standard or some kind of regime. You know, you look at um, uh, you know I, I, I think the gold standard has a lot to offer. I'd certainly like to study it. I'd like to see expert recommendations on it. Um, but I don't think it's necessary. Uh, you look at what Volcker and Reagan did. We went from a collapsing dollar in 1980 to king dollar in 1984, just a matter of a few years, uh, because of the low tax 
uh, sound dollar policies of Vulcan Reagan. So you can do that again with the right leadership. We just don't have the right leadership in the market today. And so, so it is a problem and we may end up on the gold standard, but, um, but it, it doesn't have to be that way. As I said, with leadership, you could have a, a king dollar. My, my concern, my expertise is not just in the international monetary system, but also as a national security advisor, national security consultant. Um, and my, I'm troubled by the fact that I don't see how you can have a strong national security with a weak dollar. I've said before that uh, ben Bernanke is a greater threat to national security than Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda is kind of on the run, but Bernanke's sitting in this uh, leather seat in the boardroom at the, uh, at the at the Federal Reserve, and so um, I think he is a great, greater threat in that sense. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you say that. Yeah, we c- couldn't realistically go to twenty percent interest rates. Uh, today, I think we'd see a collapse very quickly of every market out there, especially real estate's been holding on by virtue of federal guaranteed mortgages and federal intervention in the mortgage-backed securities arena. So we get 8% interest rates and real estate could really implode. So it's a lot more uh, delicate a situation now, it appears, than back uh, when Reagan... Yeah, but we, we don't need... We don't need- yeah, I was going to say, we don't need 20% interest rates, have about 20 basis points. I mean, 1%, 1%, 1% would be an earthquake. So I, my, my point is, how about letting the market decide? How about that? I mean, it might be that the market settles in at one and a half, two 2%. I'm not sure where the market would settle in. That's the whole point. Nobody's smarter than the market. But what we, what we have now, we don't have market economics. We have theater uh, stage managed by the Fed and the Treasury. Uh, also, going back to your point, Carrie, about, you know, possession is nine tenths of the law. I certainly agree with that. Um, but, you know, a lot of people say, you know, they don't really understand uh, as between the Treasury and the Fed who owns the gold. And it's an interesting question. I mean, technically, the answer is the Treasury. Mm-hmm. But uh, I always like to say the Army has the gold because uh, our <laughs> depository, there are two Army bases, Fort Knox and West Point. So I think the Army has the gold at the end of the day. Yeah, well, he who uh, he who has the guns uh, has the gold and basically makes the golden rule, I guess. And, you know, it's it's so right. fascinating, even, even down in lower Manhattan. And if you haven't gone down to the Federal Reserve's gold vault, it is an incredibly great free uh, tour that, you know, you spend a couple hours mm-hmm. there and it really, the magnitude of the situation starts to sink in. And you realize that the system we have now, it's, it's evolved, you know, through really from biblical times, uh, from so many different civilizations, and we wound up with this thing. And somehow gold always was the unifying theme in the monetary system. And when civilizations abandoned it and fiat money or you know, in Rome with the uh, melting down of the coins and uh, debasement. When debasement comes, the civilization inevitably takes a hit. I think that's what a lot of thinking people, their fear is now that we're at this debasement. It's The pace has dramatically increased over the past four or five years. And like you said, it's going to wind up in one of these areas and and four is looking more and more likely all the time, which means that if you believe that four is possible, and really if any of these are possible, your only defense, like you said, is hard assets, gold, silver, I guess to some extent collectibles. I don't know what that, that Duesenberg is going to do for you when basically uh, people are worrying about their next meal, but probably at least it'll be better than just holding paper, right? Well, yeah, sure. It depends on your kind of net worth going in. I think for most people, gold and even silver coins, I think, uh, you know, in, a, in, in an extreme case, uh, your gold coin might be almost too valuable. I mean, if you're out to barter for a week's worth of groceries, you're not going to give away an ounce of gold for that. But an ounce of silver might be the right uh, the right rate of exchange. So I, I recommend people have, a, you know, a monster box or two. You know, a monster box comes right from the... U.S. Mint, it's 501 ounce uh, American Eagle silver, you know, pure silver coins. Uh, it comes in nice treasured green. It's all sealed. A lot of people never break the seal. They just sort of, you know, put the uh, monster box in a, in a secure place. But uh, that's one thing that, that, that people can do. I think is a good idea. Um, you know, you talk to, uh, there's there's money in the United States. It's maybe 100 years old. And we call it the old money. And there's a lot of new money around. But you go to Europe and you talk to, 
billionaire families there or occasionally you find some where they have sort of dynastic wealth where they've had the money for you know 500 years or 400 years as the case may be and you ask them how they you know survived the 30 years war and the wars of louis the 14th napoleonic wars nazi invasions etc and they'll tell you their formula is uh, you know a third a third a third and what they mean is one third gold one third land one third fine art and really good art not baseball cards but you know yeah. the classic paintings and, and the notion is you know if the, the if the if the enemy is on the outskirts of town they're burning everything in sight you can cut your paintings out of the frame roll them up put them in your backpack grab your gold coins get on your horse or maybe your motorcycle today and ride away and when the dust settles you come back you should be able to reestablish title to your land dump your coins on the table, put your art back on the wall, and you're good to go. A lot of people have been wiped out in the meantime. So there's not, you need a little cash to run your yacht or your, your jet plane on the side, but that, that's not a bad formula. It does, it does uh, I call it the 30, 30 years war portfolio. But for uh, people who are not sort of in the billionaire category where you're, you're running around with a Picasso in your backpack, <laughs> uh, you know, I think gold and silver coins are, are, are ready to go. Funny when you talk about that an ounce of gold be being almost worth too much because what you're saying if it's worth seven thousand dollars in a few years then you've got equivalent of a seven thousand dollar bill and i remember my parents telling me stories about the great depression where if you had a hundred dollar bill there were very few places that you could actually get change of that hundred you couldn't go to a supermarket and break a hundred people actually discounted hundred dollar bills for like $92 uh, just to get the change because you couldn't get it. The banks didn't have it. It was a fortune back then, $100. That brings the question to me is when you talked about the 1800s from the time we that Jackson abolished the Second Bank of the United States to the founding of the Federal Reserve, we didn't have a national bank, a central bank. We got along okay. The question really is... Uh, in this day and age, could that could that really happen? Could we kind of agree on what money is without the benefit of the guiding hand of the government? And then that prosperity that occurred during that period of time was the greatest accretion of wealth up to then in the history of man. And is that a way to recapture it? Well, yeah, Carrie, I talk about this in, in my book. And we again, history shows that you don't need a central bank. I think that's that part of the debate is, uh, is settled. The question is whether it's desirable under some conditions. And, and um, you know, again, my view is, uh, and I talk about this in the book, a, a kind of gold standard for the 21st century, modern, flexible gold standard, which would combine two elements. You'd start out with a, with a fixed ratio, and that would be the result of study. I don't, I think one of the mistakes, uh, clearly one of the mistakes that was made in the 1920s when they went back to the gold standard, which they had abandoned to fight World War I, they went back at the wrong price. They went back at the pre-World War I price. Given the amount of money that had been printed during World War I, that was massively deflationary. It did contribute to the Great Depression. And the result has been that gold has been discredited ever since. And the academic economists will raise the sand and say, you know, you can't go back to the gold standard because it caused the Great Depression. Well, the answer is, uh, yes, it did uh, cause the Great Depression, but not because of gold, but because of the price. They got the price wrong. And so the equivalent today would be to make sure you get the price right. And that should be studied. And uh, as I said, there are a number of variables that go into that. But assuming you get that right, uh, then the question is, uh, you know, the Fed would then have to stand up to the market. Let's just take uh, $5,000 an ounce. I mean, uh, I don't know what the right number will be, but... I think I've asked the right questions, and if, if you studied it and came out of $5,000 an ounce, in theory, the Fed would be, in effect, a, a market maker, conduct open market operations in gold. If the price went down to $49.95, they'd be a buyer. If the price rose to $50.50, they'd be a seller. Now, is there buying or selling gold around that $5,000 price in order to maintain the price? And if people have confidence in your monetary policy, you shouldn't experience a run on the bank. Now, suddenly... Uh, lots of people were showing up with paper saying, yeah, give me that gold at, uh, you know, at that $5,000 price and the Fed and the gold was draining out of the system. That would tell you that your monetary policy was too easy and then you could tighten money and reestablish that equilibrium. So it's as much a price mechanism or price sig signal as it is anything. And uh, if you listen to what the market's telling you, it, in, in my example, it would be telling you that people have lost confidence 
in the monetary policy. And since um, uh, inflation is as much a behavioral psychological phenomenon as it is a monetary phenomenon, I mean, yes, the quantity theory of money does have some, you know, it's kind of a truism, it's a tautology, but in uh, conducting thought experiments, one of the things it tells you is it's not just the quantity, it's the velocity, and the velocity is fundamentally behavioral and, and psychological. It's one of the reasons the Fed spend so much time messaging and trying to manipulate behavior because they understand that how people feel is as important as uh, how much money the Fed prints. And so that being the case, you could have a flexible monetary policy and a gold standard, but the two of them would have to, have to sync up around the target price, and you would use the price mechanism to tell you if you're doing a good job or not. So there is this kind of hybrid. I'm not dogmatic about the right way to do it, but I am emphatic about the fact that it needs to be studied and we need to, to get away from the system we have today, which is destroying the dollar, and I think destroying national security. I was just going to say, really appreciate you coming on. Just to give us where we find your Twitter feed, because I know you're really active there. Yeah, thanks, Kerry. My sure. Twitter feed is at James G. Rickards. Rickards, R-I-C-K-A-R-D-S. But uh, just do at, at James G. Rickards. You'll find it right away. And I welcome people to follow along. And I'll put out a constant stream of commentary, uh, mostly on the international monetary system. Jim, thanks so much for being on the show. Great having you. And we're going to definitely read the book, get back with you uh, in a month or two, and see what's happening. Thanks, Gary. Take care.